There we go. And then for those of you that are remoting in, uh, feel free to use the chat box to uh, ask any questions. And at the end of the seminar, I'll check in the chat box to make sure that we hit all of those questions. Um, so welcome also. Um, oh, Ashis is here too. Hey, Ashis. Um, <laughs> I hope you don't need to learn chemistry. <laughs> He's one of the chemists at Southern Research. Um, so I'm going to minimize this. There you go. And then I'll hand the floor to Corinne. Um, so there you go. Well, thank you everyone for coming this afternoon, and it's good to know that here, at least on site, there's no chemist, so I'll try to keep it <laughs> at a level so I don't, um, you know, to, to understand everything I'm saying. I, I tried to take into account, I gave the same, well, similar lecture last year, um, just to give more examples, not too busy slides and things like that, because sometimes we just get carried away and <laughs> put everything on one slide, and so um, if you have any questions as I'm going along, just raise your hand and uh, Michael will uh, arrange to for everyone to hear the question. Uh, <clears throat> the goal today, at least in 40 minutes or so, is to give you ideas of how a chemist, when we see a leaf come out of a high throughput screen or whether it's structurally designed, how we look at it, how we try to progress it through the pathway till we identify a good lead series where ultimately then we do a lot of chemistry in conjunction with our biology counterparts to move a compound into animal studies because whether it's you need to get into an animal study or not, we have to get it to a, a, a stage where the profile looks like it has all drug-like properties where we can hopefully move it into um, clinical trials. So this is just to remind everyone that discovering a drug doesn't happen overnight. It takes years. It takes a lot of money. And the percentage of success is usually low. And that's not due to not good work, not good science. It's just it's really a difficult process to optimize all the properties of a molecule in conjunction with the biological activity and selectivity and off-target effects to make the compound go into a human body and go to the target and see efficacy. So this just shows you that um, you know the odds are less than 10% of making it to market and that's after you identify compounds that potentially can go into animals. And so you know we start with hundreds of thousands of compounds um, as a mass screen hit as I'll show you and then you dwindle it down to leads and all that. So it's just to try to put everything into um, perspective as we go through this. And here is shown uh, just the different um, parameters that we need to focus on once we have either a lead identified, but before that an actual hit from a high throughput screen that shows the activity, the biological activity that we're interested in for a particular program. And so we need to look at the potency, we need to look at selectivity, um, the stability in a body. So we look at um, we look at it in mice and human because many of the models or any rodent model really, mice or rat, we look at the stability of a compound when it goes into the system, um, et cetera, solubility, and then, then once you get your efficacy, you have to look at formulation, et cetera. So this is just to show you that there's many steps to get up to a clinical trial. So the steps to go from hit to lead, how do we identify potential chemical matter, potential chemical leads? There's two ways. There's identification of hits um, and leads through high throughput screen through structure-based computer design, or through sometimes finding a, a lead in a literature, and you start modifying it to um, get novelty and to maintain the potency. Um, since a lot of, say, literature, and there's a lot of uh, biological expertise and precedent already in the literature for the target, and actually for a series. So if we can carve our way into a novel chemical lead, then that would be another alternative. And we've had a couple of examples over you know, different programs I've worked on that we've actually done that. <clears throat> and then once you find this potential hit or lead compound, uh, you have to evaluate it and wonder if it's um, has drug-like properties that we can pursue, or if it doesn't, I'll explain a few examples on how we try to modify it so that we can move the program forward. Can the modifications be made to the series to make it drug-like, and is it, a, is it a dead end or not? So does, we have to always make sure we do the right experiments or the right studies or the right evaluations of the molecule to get to go, no-go decisions quickly because, you know, drug discovery 
is uh, an expanded view, I guess, of basic research. Uh, basic research, you can do different experiments, try new parameters, try new, I don't know, um, reaction conditions. But with drug discovery, you need to move along quickly. You need to make smart decisions. Sometimes you don't have the resources that you need all the time. And, you know, it's, it's a matter of using different tools, as I'll allude to here, to help make the right decisions with the right molecules. Yes, yeah, Karen. I have a question. In all this uh, step, though, where is the intellectual property and novelty of the compound to get to site? I mean, where is in your different uh, step there? I, I believe that at some point you have to say is it novel that we can pass it right. and so it, Right. So once you have, so I'll, I'll try to make sure I point that out as I give different examples. But, you know, once you have a hit compound, you have to validate that you actually have a good series that you, you make, say, uh, say you have a hit compound, it's, it's a known compound, make 10 compounds, you make 20 compounds, you're starting to see an SAR there. At that point, then you look into, you know, you're, you're constantly looking in the literature or for patent literature, but you see, oh, this compound is similar to this. Well, let's see if we can make some changes to make it our own IP. And then, and at that point, once you make a collection of compounds that you feel that are novel, then you have, you know, external attor attorney look at it. And also it's a little bit, you have to confirm they actually have a, a series to work on. And then you have to see if you can evolve it into a novel series. And then once you see SAR, because you're going to need reasonable data, then you would want to file on it. I may or may not be the only person in this room who doesn't know what SAR stands for. SAR is <laughs> Structure Activity Relationship. So that means when you're making changes to a compound, whether you're at a methyl group or fluorine group or whatever, you start to see changes in re relation to the biological activity that you are testing the compounds in. So it's a structure and an activity relationship. So things that you put to the compound, you won't get activity, or and then, so that's a that's good information too. Or then things that become a problem. Sorry, <laughs> that's a good question. Please interrupt me. <laughs> Okay, so let's go through just some examples that we have in conjunction in our ADDA programs that we've actually used high throughput screening. And some of you, if you've been here last year, have seen these activities. Um, where we get the compounds from to run the high throughput screens with our programs here is from, we have, at Southern, we have a, um, about a $1 million, $1 million, one million <laughs> I wish, small molecule uh, library, which comes from various vendors. We have a kinase library, consists of all these things, approved drugs by the FDA, and then we have uh, recently, a few years ago, we bought some Kragen libraries. And then we also have a proprietary library of around 14K, which is, is uh, of course, increasing at the time, but of the, the screen that we actually use now has been uh, subsets of our proprietary library, and it was about 14K, which we need to add to, actually, because we have a significantly number more now. A couple of the programs within the ADDA that we've used our high throughput screening facility is, uh, you may be familiar with one of the CNS programs, a large program. Here we use, say, almost 200K compounds um, in their HTS using this novel all phosphorylation assay. Our hit rate there was about 1.5%, and we actually identified several hit series there. Uh, using different modeling and multi-parameter <coughs> optimizations, um, we identified um, compounds that potentially could be hits, and with that parameter of an IC50 of less than 100 nanomolar, we obtained four hit series. And out of that, and I'll explain what we, how we evaluate different chemical series, we focused on the most drug-like series at the time, and if it were four, we would make some compounds, put them through the biological mm -hmm. assays, and then in it, and the end result here was we had, uh, focused on these pyridyl varieties, which also went into looking at the IP. So we had these four hit series, and some of them were, I mean, the LARC area is well known in the literature, so it's really hard to design compounds to claim novelty. And, and this was the series for novelty, it was a series for stability, et cetera. So, so anyway, that was the series that we ended up working on. But it did come from pretty much a high mm -hmm. screening effort. I haven't missed something, but when you say heat, because you have some compound that you think that may do something for what you want. Mm -hmm. What makes that definition different from the heat? Is something that the so a hit, so a hit so a hit is a, is not very potent most of the times. So you 
you know, a, a screens are run at one concentration, at different, whether it's 100 micromole or 30 micromole. So you have these compounds that are showing, say, our cutoff in collaboration with our biologists, you know, what do we want to look for? 50% at, say, 30 micromole, and it's third of the hits. So then when you get those hits, then you want to do IC50 determination, so a 10-point concentration curve. And then from there, the ones that reproduce after, you know, looking at fresh solid and retesting it, then you get your, you narrow down your hits to be more of the series that you'll focus on, in addition to looking at the different drug-like properties that are in there. So you have a lot of hits, and then you have to narrow those hits down. From the hits, then you get to the chemical needs that you can follow through. Thank you. This is another program in the C. It turns out I pulled out all the CNS programs, but this is the one for Parkinson's disease. And here, this was a much smaller screen. It was two pilot screens done, and it was a 5K each. And um, the primary, actually, I guess it was after the pilot screen they ran the primary screen. This was before I, I came. It was on 150K screen using conditions optimized and adapted to high throughput. So that's, I think, what had happened. The biologists had run the two the pilot screens, and then they optimize the conditions to run 100K compounds. Um, in the screens, we have to pick positive controls for whatever the target is for, and in this one, it was rosaglutazone. And the compound um, <clears throat> from the 10K, the positive controls were a compound that we selected as one of our own chemical series, as well as a compound that's up in the literature. And then a secondary confirmation assay was um, established, and then from there, we evaluated the hits in the chemical series, and we're at that stage where we might actually identify a potent um, chemical series that we'd like to work on. Now we're working with our biologists to look at the target of this particular program because it'll help move the, uh, the drug discovery effort and interest in the program if we know the target for this um, area. Another one is the tau fin. Here, a primary screen was done on 100K compounds. The cutoff, for example, here was 64% inhibition. Uh, we did compound uh, a dose response on almost 2,000 compounds. And um, from there, we did more dose response in four different assays of the compounds that made the cutoff here. And then out of the end result was we had 64 compounds that met this criteria. And I'll show you different screening um, trees going compound progression pathways that we've used for different programs going forward. But this is the early stage when you actually run the high throughput screen, you have to get down to a group of compounds. And so 64 met the criteria. Further evaluation with our biologists led us to 10 great compounds that are actually pretty diverse in chemical structure, which we're starting to do synthesis on particular leads based on the biological activity and the different drug-like properties that we've evaluated from the different Scavenous. Here's one uh, with an HIV program, not affiliated with the ADDA, but um, we do it at Southern. And here we've run almost our, uh, our whole high throughput screen of 700 plus compounds. And you know, here we looked at 25% inefficient as cutoffs. Um, and then that led us to 3,000 compounds, where we then did an IC50, got us down to 1,700 counter screens, rule of 10, selectivity, binding affinity, we ended up with six compounds. And um, we selected two leads from there. And I'll show you a slide of what came out of this program and how we've optimized the compounds to be potent and actually look pretty promising. So it's, it's, it's quite an intense um, pathway. <laughs> OK, so I talked a little bit about how we identify hits. Now we're going to go to what do, we, what do we do with the hits that come out? How do we evaluate them and, and move them forward? The different properties, I know this is busy, but we'll just highlight on, look at the blue um, head, headlines there. The different physical chemical properties. We have to look at molecular weight for a compound. We want molecular weight to be as small as possible, but not too small, because then it's considered, say, a fragment. And if it's really too small, then a compound could be non-selective. It could hit off-target profiling. If you get it back, you'll see it hits so many other different targets. So it has to be designed so it's hitting your target and not hitting so many other targets. But um, the molecular weight for ideal drugs should be, you know, between three and 400, ideally 300. Um, when you hear someone say, oh, I have a small molecule lead and it's 500 plus molecular weight, 
that's usually not that small molecule. Although I always like to point out that the exception is Lipitor. Lipitor is a cholesterol lowering drug. It's a billion dollar market and it's over 500 molecules. So there are always exceptions to the rule, but so these are always guidelines that we like to use. Polar surface. Yeah. There's some, uh, some company they uh, developed uh, some antibody uh, based drug. Mm -hmm. That is a high molecular, like uh, mm -hmm. 150 k usually antibody size. Mm -hmm. And that applied to this rules. No, so that's not. A, this is for small molecule drug discovery. Antibodies is a whole different. Um, there's another rule for the this. Well, I think, um, I don't know, we, uh, another rule, well, it has to, I guess if it's an antibody, it's going to have to be, the, there's different pharmacokinetic properties to look at that for the thing and how it's going to be delivered, usually the injection, whether it's IM or um, sub-Q or, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's not small molecule drug discovery. Okay. So different rules, yes, there's different formulations, the different <coughs> pharmacokinetic properties, yeah. Okay. So it will depend a little bit on indication whether an antibody is suitable to be used for this. In oncology, for example, mm -hmm. people are really sick, they're willing to get an infusion of stuff. Right. If you have, you, you don't want to use a cholesterol lowering drug probably if you have an injection if you can just take a tablet. Mm -hmm. So it depends a little bit on your disease what, what you want to do. Okay. Right? So I guess I'm curious, and I think this will apply to, to all of these things. Um, where do these rules come from? And I mean, so in, in this case, you said you'll, as you're, you're narrowing things down, you'll eliminate anything that's over 400 mm -hmm. molecular weight. Mm -hmm. But there's at least one drug that mm -hmm. is useful that mm -hmm. is over 500. So mm -hmm. how, how much do you miss because you've decided we're going to have a cutoff here, and we're going to have a cutoff here, and we think these aren't going to be interesting, so we're just not yeah. going to look at them. Well, that, that's always the case with anything, regardless of a drug discovery or not, right? But um, so there is evidence, there is background evidence, there is studies done. For example, I don't have it in this talk, but in a CNS talk, so there's studies done on CNS drugs, uh, like I don't know, I think we picked 30 and not a CNS drugs, and then we looked at all the molecular weights and all, and it showed that CNS drugs were all around, but the, the um, most successful ones were around 300. Now. <coughs> to answer your point, if you're running the program and you're following guidelines and you're not getting anything, well, you get a broad on them. And so you have to see, okay, well, you know, let's look at the 500, 550, and let's see if we can modify that. So it's not, you can't have tunnel vision. You have to have the guidelines, but you also have to be trying to move everything forward until you get to something that you're satisfied with. Yeah, so I mean, as I'll say, they're guidelines, they're not rules, and there's always exceptions to rules, so that's another reason why it makes it quite difficult to get a drug on the market. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a PSA, polar surface area, is a calculated value that looks at the um, surface sum of all the polar atoms, um, in including like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, um, and it's used for optimization of cell permeability. It's a real interesting tool that we use for mo mainly uh, CNS drugs. So, you know, the value for that when you do the calculations, you want it under, say, 70, but ultimately it's 40. Now, I don't think I've ever been in the CNS program where I've gotten a drug to go in animals that had a PSA around 40. It was always around 70. So, and then if you look at the drugs that are on the market, the average is around, I think it's 55 because that, you know, somewhere around 70, somewhere the 40. Solubility is really important, especially if you want to do oral um, dosing. And that's usually a big hurdle for the chemist to get over. We'll get all the parameters optimized and it's solubility. And um, to try to, um, there are ways, there's different formulations. You can do nano uh, particles, you can do micronization, different uh, ways you can get around that. Provide, so this is an example. You can't get to your solubility number of 10 micromolar but you're seeing efficacy in animals and all. And so what you can do to go to the extremes is try a formulation where you can get the compound to be orally absorbed. And so there are ways around that because it was, that's the only thing that's stopping the program from going forward. Uh, log D and log P are things we look at for distribution coefficients. Um, and then Lipinski's rule of five, this was uh, developed by Bill Lipinski many years ago and he actually worked at Pfizer with us. 
And this is some of the key rules for small molecule drug discovery, molecular weight less than 5, C log P less than 5, less than 5, hydrogen bonds and all. Just, I mean, when you look at this, it really um, then talks about how many rings in a molecule. So it's just when you have something so big, it's so hard to either get it to be selective or get it to be soluble. I mean, it's just sometimes if you step back and look at what we're trying to do, a lot of it is, uh, if we're scientists, common sense. Because how can you actually make a small molecule when it's this big, ugly thing? It's, it's just sometimes not possible. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about the, the only the only drugs I know, the structures of off the top of my head, mm -hmm. are antibiotics. And <laughs> yeah. natural yeah. products, which don't call these at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so, it, you know, years ago, nobody, they just uh, made compounds and they put them in animals, you know. Um, but as, as I think the science evolved, and, and I remember this, I was, when I was in industry, we would go right from potency to animals. But then what, what, what we were facing at Park Davis and then Pfizer was that we were getting a lot of attrition in clinical trials. So we were lucky if we got, and so then we all went backwards and we said, all right, so what are the tools that we can put in place to help us focus? And so it's, it's changed. And, you know, for what it's worth, there aren't as many drugs going on the market now. And whether we're being too careful or not, I don't know. But the attrition rate really changed the, the philosophy of pushing programs forward back in, like, the, this was the early 90s. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so pharmacokinetic properties, I talked a little bit about this. So we use, um, so we get compounds that are potent, we get compounds, um, we look at solubility. We also want to get a sense of how a compound's going to behave when we put it in an animal or a human. Um, the um, microsomal stability, we look at mouse, rat, or human, well, and human. And the mouse or rat is what, you know, correlates with what our biologists will be testing. But it, um, it gives you a sense of the first pass metabolism when you first in ingest a compound. And, <clears throat> you know, what you're looking at are drug metabolizing enzymes, such as the P450 enzymes or the CYP isocyanes. And now the FDA looks at all of these, um, they want data on all of these CYP enzymes. And I think there's three, six, there's at least nine. Years ago, it was like six. And for CNS, we, you know, we only had to really have data for like 3A4 and 1A2 and so. So, I mean, the, 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 the hurdles that one has to get over are increasing as time goes forward. So this is just another example. The hepatocyte stability sometimes mimics the microsomal stability. It's more expensive. It takes longer to do the study. Um, and this really mimics the, the second um, pass metabolism. Which, it's, this is done in cells. This is done in microsomes. Um, this contains phase two enzymes such as sulfatases, um, glucuronidation. So it's it's like when you really get into the gut uh, with the compound. And so um, the hepatocyte metabolism profiles usually yield more metabolites and information about the metabolic fate of the test compound. Um, so a lot of times, if we're struggling with the microsome stability, you know, we send compounds off to get hepatocyte stability to see if there's a correlation, and usually there is. Um, but you know, like we'll, we'll come across in every program, I think, where compounds are much more metabolically stable in the human liver microsome than the human hepatocytes versus the mouse. And so, for example, in HIV programs, we may not have to go into an animal. And so we can optimize with the human microsome stability. So it's just another variable to consider. So this just shows you taking all those parameters into account. When you find these hits and then you do a little bit of SAR and you, you look like you're heading toward a lead, you, the early stage um, guidelines that you use are rule of five, structural alerts, which I'll go into. Ease of synthesis, so, you know, natural products are 20 steps, uh, antibiotics sometimes are 10 enough. Okay, so you have to look at your resources, how much time, where are you versus competition. You know, are, is, you know, Glaxo and Pfizer, you know, already at uh, going in file 9D and we're just starting to um, synthesize. To, so, I mean, you have to take all those things into consideration. And, you know, would we be competitive in a sense to, you know, break, you know, uh, be as head of the science uh, versus the other companies. You know, we look at the solubility, log B, etc. So that's the first step. When you get compounds that meet most of those or some of those to your um, satisfaction, 
The second is, you know, you have your activity profile, all you want to get the bioavailability, you want to get your half-life um, clearance, you look at plasma, all these plasma protein binding, you look at genotox, herb testing, um, P450 interactions. This is once you're into the lead development stage. So if you have a lead, then why don't we just profile it like this so that we have a baseline? And then we know what changes when we make to the molecule. Are we getting better? Because sometimes these are predictive, sometimes they're not. And, you know, you have to take everything into consideration. So you step two is all through all your vitro stuff, right? Yes, yes. So the next, after you get through this stage, step two, you'll go into proof of concept into your animal study. So if you can't get an orally active compound, but you can get reasonable exposure of the compound in the system with IP or sub-Q or IV, then you can do proof of concept study there. The caution that I've always worried about when we do that is, all right, we show that it hits the target, but if we do need an orally active compound, when you go back to try to fix the molecule, you're going to lose the nice profile that you have for oral active. So it's, it's can you uh, give us an estimate, like uh, how much of uh, the cost and also time required to do step one, step two? <laughs> <laughs> uh, cost and time? Mm -hmm. On average. <clears throat> well, I don't know about cost. It, I, it depends on who you have doing the work, etc. But, you know, I think the, from a mass screen hit, uh, a mass screen will usually take several months. Um, identifying hits, so probably about a year and a half to get to hits, and then I'd probably say another six months you can get to an identified lead compound, um, and then depends six to twelve months to get to preclinical candidates, provided everything you know you're mo moving in the right direction. With regard to cost, I mean that depends on the people that are doing the work, the assay, how difficult the assay is. Um, the throughput of the assay, um, et cetera. So it's a little bit more. Although we do a lot of cost estimates when we put in yeah. proposals. The reason so. I'm asking is because uh, like, when we have some common, we're going to apply for you know, funding. Mm -hmm. So we can know roughly how much money can we I think more except for one of our programs that is currently at the end of step one, we're getting into step two. He said to get to step two would take about between one and two million dollars. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just one example, but mm. that's kind of the ballpark. That, I mean, if you can maybe you get lucky and do it for 300000 or if it's really hard for them, it costs you 2 or $3 million. So there's a big spread, but it's not going to be R01. <laughs> <laughs> on that, so uh, the ADDA, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. the so is it going to move step one to step two? Yes. And what kind of uh, what kind of application is done? Because I know I send an R one, uh -huh. so I'm saying okay, we ask about the optimization of us in all the scaffold, mm -hmm. so it's not just one, year. Uh, and the total budget was two point one million dollar. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking okay, when can we apply to this with a so, so for your projects that come through, like yours, yeah. Uh, fairly recently, we got a philanthropy money uh -huh. that helps with that. Yeah. So the ones that are, so we have a couple of programs mm -hmm. that have graduated from high throughput training, and they have attracted a chemical matter. And group is working on that with the chemist. So we have now, since about a year, year and a half, we have some resources also the state has invested some money in this. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are opportunities. We cannot do that for a lot of projects, yeah, obviously, because yeah. UAV doesn't have $20 million laying around. But uh, <laughs> maybe they do. And they don't they do. Us, I don't know. <laughs> but for, uh, for ones that, that seem attractive, mm -hmm. there, there are for a limited number of programs we can do that. Yeah. I think if the, the ADD programs, like, you know, they get to a point where we have a lead series, and the, then the throughput and the flow of testing and all is looking promising, and there's interest in that target, right, mm -hmm. in the external environment. That's a good, you know, reason to put extra funding on a program. And, and I would like also to ask you the question, because 
I know that you can develop a drug of small molecules for, for uh, in vivo molecular hope. Yeah. Yeah. That is different than a drug and I would yes. like to to know your your your, your to to get your your brain on what is the advantage and that as of a probe versus a drug. Yeah. So you know that gets back to the fact so if you're if if you if you're having difficulty say optimizing for an oral indication, you may want to go in for a probe at that point because at least it would help the biologist learn about the mechanism and the target, etc. In the meantime, you can propose then to do additional medicinal chemistry on the molecule or backup compounds or similar scaffolds or not. If you're early on in the stage, I think going after a probe if it's a novel area is a good thing. I mean, it'll help you know, the biologists optimize whatever assays they need or will help the chemists learn a little bit more about the, the, the types of compounds that are going to inhibit. So I think it depends on the target, the stage of a program. Um, I, you know, I always advocate for can you move a, a probe to a, a drug? Yeah, you can. No, no, you can. It depends on resources and what the molecule looks like. Um, it can be done. It can be done. A lot of times when we push programs forward before, you know, not even applying for NIH grants, um, you're, you're going along and you have a compound that looks really great and it's doing everything, but we then decided that, you know, the PK wasn't right, so we ended up developing that for a tracer, a radio mm -hmm. tracer, so an imaging agent, while we start doing chemistry over here on the series to try to optimize the PK, so, it, you know, you can do that in parallel developing a probe or a ligand or a, um, something like that while you're pushing the matter forward. And it depends. You can, yeah, depending on how many chemists and throughput, you can do a lot of things, but it can be done. Yeah, we actually did that type of work for muscarinic antagonists, or we had uh, radio ligands done at the University of Michigan when I was out there, and then we uh, optimized to get compounds in animals, so it worked out well. And then the third step is um, once you get into, um, you have profiles of uh, compounds that look reasonable to go into animal studies in the um, proof of concept. Um, I just wanted to add this in. There's an extra step here when you're dealing with the CNS because you have to get uh, the compounds into the brain and have a reasonable brain to plasma ratio or reasonable concentration of the drug in the brain. Okay, so structural alerts have, um, have the potential for intrinsic activity. DNA intercalation, metal coordination of metabolic activation. Um, the binding could then lead to mutagenicity, SIP inhibition, direct toxicity, carcinogenicity, et cetera, et cetera. Structural alert alone is not predictive of an adverse effect, though. Um, other factors to consider if, if you have a structural alert or not is the clinical dose is not right, the route of drug clearance, or the presence of metabolic roots. So, um, and so some molecules with a structural alert may never generate an adverse toxicological effect or SIP inhibition outcome, and there's examples of safe marketed drugs <laughs> with structural alerts. Um, called, there are examples of attrition of compounds due to an adverse outcome with a, without a recognized structural alert. And I get so many times from chemists in my department that, well, there's a drug in the market, Quinn, that has this, or there's this, or Hydantoins, or whatever, and yes, there are, but if we have other chemical matter that don't have those structural alerts, let's work on them first, because ultimately, at the end of the day, when you get into your in vivo studies, your um, dose response studies, I've seen so many things that look so great, and then you get hepatic toxicity, or liver toxicity, and it, and it really does come back to haunt you, so yes, there are examples, but don't be so desperate just to work on things that do have a structural alert if you have something else. And if you do have structural alerts, then you try to modify them. So how do you, <coughs> so um, when, when you drop it, because you, you hear it and really, uh, and, 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 uh, take this drug, but the advice, the, the advertising is longer to the side effects, so be careful if you have that. So my, my point is, how will you have this alert and not get a drug, or what is the limit? Because you, most of, of the stuff that you hear is how bad the drug could be for you, and by the way, can do something good for you. So I guess it's related with that, with all the other can uh, trigger. Well, that. yeah, I, I don't know if it's related to structural alerts or whatever. It could be related to clearance of the compound. It's not getting cleared out of your body and staying up. Because if you listen to the 
the commercials on TV for drugs. <laughs> well, you, don't want, you, don't want, you don't want to take anything, right? But that's just because the companies have to cover themselves and the liabilities and the lawsuits. But I, I would have to say more than not, drugs on the market don't have obvious structural alerts that we know would call, cause brain um, toxicity or liver toxicity. But, you know, you never know, right? I mean, a drug is a foreign substance, regardless of what it is that's going into your system. But what I mean, a drug that has some the structural alert is, is going to be approved by FDA? Or, that or has a structural Well, it depends. Yes, if, if they've done extensive toxicity studies that are usually the norm, whether it's an 8 or 12 week in the animal model and they do not see toxicity or they have a right therapeutic safety window between potency and when they see activity that I mean they have to and then they'll have to have maybe preclinical clinical studies or a clinician say yes well we can monitor yes yeah it can it can happen but I mean there are a lot of precautions taken yes sir. are the libraries that you screen initially chosen in such a way to minimize the risk of adverse effects yes yeah, so I, it wasn't usually when my words are put together, and I know that Southern did this, they had different um, structure uh, panels and screens that Helmholtz went through before they put them into the library. However, um, there are, I don't know when that was done, but there are compounds that come out that are pretty ugly still in the mess. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to push <laughs> us to get, we really do need a library, a new library at some point. It's a big expense, but it would be nice to redo that. So here are some structural alerts. This is this is just a handful. Last time I had shown them, uh, I had. <laughs> and, the, and this is just, I mean, so when you see three three ring structures, right? So acritinones or these these cumarin type of things, anything tricyclic is always known to potentially give uh, intercalation cell to, uh, to DNA intercalators and DNA damaging agents, even these amino triazoles. Now we have compounds that go forward with amino triazoles, but it's the substitution patterns that you put on it that helps devoid it of the toxicity. These are potential chelators, imidazoles and triazoles, pyridine, nitrogen, anything with so many nitrogens in a molecule potentially can have a lot of adverse effects. So, you know, we come up with these analogs we want to make that have, you know, probably six nitrogens. I mean, other than sometimes they're detonators, I mean, they could be really pretty toxic <laughs> too. Uh, undergoing metabolic activation. So these these types of ring systems, furans, thiophenes, paroles, thiams, so they can get easily metabolized in the body with hydroxylation. And so if they get, you'll never know then if that metabolite could potentially be toxic or it's not, or if you've screened and we've optimized for this particular moiety to be active, once it gets in your body, it's not there anymore, so you lose the potency that you want in vivo. Uh, quinones, uh, anilines are not very good, and neither are hydroxyl anilines. Thiourias, thiocarbonates, they get broken up or they are very reactive. And so either under metabolic activation or not, these are just reactive species. So anything with an aldehyde is easily, can be, a nucleophile can easily attack this carbonyl group. Michael acceptors, this is a very um, active bond. And then thiols and disulfides, they cleave or they get oxidized. So, so these are things that, now if they're in a molecule and they're heavily um, you know, protected or whatever, they may not be as reactive, but it's something to keep in mind. So how do you improve the metabolism of some of these structural alerts? Well, you want to try to avoid structural moieties in the molecule. You can find replacements or bioisosteer. So for, like, example, carboxylic acids, you can do oxazoles, oxidiazoles, um, uh, different uh, substituted phenyl rings with hydroxyl groups. There's a lot of different replacements or isosteers that you can put in place of a structural alert. You can block potential sites of metabolism on the ring if you have a bare naked phenyl ring. Um, all those sites can get hydroxylated, as I'm going to show you, but um, if we put different substituents on the ring, um, it'll stop the metabolism. And then we also have um, this program, for example, one of many, um, to cal use calculations such as CSL, which is um, composite site liability. And this is to help prioritize analogs with predictive metabolic stability. Rather than submitting every compound, into our ADME group to get met metabolic stability, you can do calculations. Now, 
Here's another caution. Sometimes they correlate, many times they don't. <laughs> and so it's something, a learning process. So within a series, you start doing your calculations and you're getting your metabolic stability and it's correlating because the lower the number, the more metabolically stable the company is, um, then we're good. There, I have programs now that it did correlate and have programs that didn't. And here's one that did. So this was towards stable analogs via the CSL calculation. So these compounds in general are all as potent. So we don't need to worry about potency. Um, if you look at the solubility, they're all pretty similar in solubility. Good, because we want that greater than 10. Um, this is their potency here. So now if you look at the CSL values, we want it lower. So the highest worst number is 1, and then the best number is 0.1. So as you can see, the numbers got better and better. So what we would hope then is if this calculated value gets lower, we're going to see better metabolic stability, say, in mouse liver microsome. And so what did we see? Down here is the mouse liver microsome. We wanted it. Our target value was greater than one hour. And we actually did see it go from 0.7, which was 18 minutes, all the way up to 300 minutes or 5 hours, which is 0.38. Okay, so we were headed in the right direction. This one, not so great. And then down here is our in vivo IV um, PK that we did. But so what were the changes we made? Okay, so here you have this bicyclic ring with nothing over here. If you try, so obviously, as I said, you want to dress up that ring so that it's not spot, hot spots for metabolism. So we put a fluorine there. Looks like it got a little bit better, even though most of the microsome did. We put a difloral here, and we got even better. So we're uh, um, blocking another side of metabolism. Now, fluorines are small. They're like hydrogens, and they can get, you know, chewed off or, I don't know, not be as effective in, in stopping metabolism. So if we put a, a nitrile group there, we improved that much better, and this one even down lower. We tried putting a CF3 group up here, and it didn't seem to... Um, stop the metabolism, metabolism as much, say, if you were comparing it um, to this, but it's very similar to just a mono-substituted phenylene. And then over here, we put the cyano and the fluorine, and it's just as good. And so, so this, this did help us, um, since we had very limited resources on here, to try to see if this was actually going to work. And lo and behold, we put these in animals and um, in IVPK, and the half-life PL is at 1.5 hours, and this compound's actually in animal studies now. So it's a tool that we can use. Um, it um, doesn't always hold out, though, and, and you should not not make a compound because it doesn't abide by this, because any even negative data is very helpful. Now, what about this compound? You you test it sequentially, or you decide all the out of at the same time and. Um, in the previous example, for example. Well, we, we, we did the calculations and we <coughs> made them all. No, we tested them all at the same time. At the same time? Yeah, more or less. You know, like you decide one test and go back to the chemistry? No, a lot of times what we'll do is when we make a compound, we don't even wait to get the biological data to submit for ADME because, um, you know, you we know, need to move things. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. too long. It gets yeah. just way too long. And sometimes the data doesn't come back as quickly as we need it. But basically, you make a prediction, decide that you need to modify, it, and we are okay. We have yeah. this combination and do what it is. Yeah. Now this is this is expected, though, right? Um, it, I think what's interesting about it here is the cyano, um, the you know blocking the sites of it. It just shows you that that in this particular case, the groups up here we used for solubility. And that helped us get the solubility. Down here was where we were targeting the metabolic stability. Yeah, yeah this was after months of already tinkering with other parts yeah. of the molecule. Yeah. Okay. Like they decided to come up with 100 structures and then make all 100. It was like more sets of 10 or 20. Oh, okay. Like that. okay. Um, so how do we improve potency and solubility? So we can add groups like hydroxy, carboxylic acids, um, ethers, nitrogens, nitrogens in the ring. Um, we can insert heterocycles, and we can interrupt, and when you have intramolecular hydrogen bonding within a molecule, it makes it very insoluble because it it's not, doesn't rotate, as well as um, inserting groups that allow compounds to rotate rather than be planar will help with the solubility. And also, like melting point, if you take a melting point of a, of a real flat planar molecule, it will be much higher than if you have bonds that can rotate. So here's an example of... Um, going towards more potent soluble compounds. Um, if you can see our potency improved quite a bit here 
but what we weren't maintaining here is the metabolic stability. And if you, if you look here, we have an unsubstituted ring here with a methyl group. Stability isn't so bad. We put a fluorine group smaller. We lost the stability and we lost the potency. So we thought, okay, well, let's add a nitrogen in this ring here, and we get the potency quite down. Metabolic stability did not improve. So, all right, so then we put a um, uh, methoxy group in a fluorine. We maintained the potency. Whoops but still didn't um, improve the metabolic stability. Um, lo and behold, we kept the nitrogen here for potency. We got rid of the fluorine and the methyl, which are potentially more metabolically unstable. And then we added this group for our solubility. Um, where we have reasonable uh, metabolic stability, both in the mouse and the human. And so um, this is a good example of um, optimizing for all three parameters. We, we, lost, we took a hit on potency, but to have the metabolic stability of greater than two hours is really good. Now, if we test this in animals and it's not active, we go back to the more potent and then try to modify it in that sense. So how long did it take for you to... This wasn't so bad. This okay. was probably three months. Um, I mean, it's all relative, right? <laughs> it wasn't a week. <laughs> but it was probably about a three-month period. But it took us a while to get to this point. But to get to this point was slow. So this is just a, a sampling of the compounds that we made. Uh, here's a, an example that's out in the literature. So this is a, um, amylo, a gamma secretase inhibitor. This will won't take long, and I'll try to wrap it up in like five minutes. This, is, um, this was called BMS uh, 708163 avagacetat. It was a gamma secretors inhibitor for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, which eventually failed due to efficacy a few years ago now. But just to look at this molecule, this was their first generation with a chiral center here. They replaced this phenyl ring, and they got their inhibition at 120, the second generation. So then they decided um, here to, um, this is chiral. There's two enantiomers, so they separated it into an R enantiomer and an S enantiomer. So here's 120 nanomolar, and you separate it. Their S enantiomer was not active, but their R enantiomer was, 13 nanomolar. So that shows you sometimes the chiral center is really important. It's a lot of times we'll make compounds when we just test the racemate. We see a hint of activity, and, you know, it has reasonable drug-like properties. It's worth to separate the enantiomers. So then what they did... Um, is they opened this ring to try to um, see if they can improve the potency, and they did to 4.1 nanomolar. And we had to uh, look at NOx selectivity for this because for the gamma secretase has two substrates. It has APP and NOx, so they needed selectivity as well. They have reasonable selectivity here, but it didn't get into the brain, and it got chewed up quite quickly. A simple fix to that, so here they have ROM was 19% at... 10 minutes of incubation, which, you know, after 30 minutes, there'd be nothing left. Um, so what they did was they add, so this, these two methyl groups will get highly metabolized, as I showed you with some of our compounds. So they put a CF3 group there. Um, they lost their potency. The selectivity increased tremendously. But then finally what they did to improve their potency was they just put a fluorine group here and a fluorine group here. So, and it also did help with the... Um, the metabolic stability as well, because now they have something out here to stop them. And that seems pretty big, right? Would yeah, I think it's like 450 or so, yeah, which would explain maybe the low brain yeah. penetration. Uh, it did, uh, the exposure wasn't where it needed to be in humans. Yeah. yeah. So here's another example. This is uh, another compound, a gamma secretase inhibitor. This was from um, GlaxoSmith. So this was a five micromolar hit. Uh, they put a methyl group, so here methyl, they converted it to an ethyl. They went down to 200 nanomolar. Um, to improve potency even more, they replaced this phenyl ring with the thi uh, substituted thiophene, which helps prevent the oxidation of that thiophene ring. They went down to 25 nanomolar, but they have two sites of metabolic um, instability here, oxidation at this methyl and glucuronidation. So this is first pass and second pass. So what they did was they substituted this these two methyls for two CF3s, and they um, didn't help with the stability or the potency. So then what they did was they took out these two methylenes and made it 
gem CF3, and they got 48 minutes of mice, which was improvement, but not good enough to go forward with. This is another example of the replacement of a fluorine and a methyl group in the same type of compound. Um, this methyl group gets metabolically chewed up, and it has 18-minute um, half-life, and here's 71 minutes. And so this actually went into animals, and it showed a 44 produ uh, reduction in uh, A beta in the hippocampus. For, this is for Alzheimer's as well. This was only 12%. And it just goes to show you that you need the compound no longer. The potency was much better for this, 8 nanomolar versus 68, but this was had a better exposure in the brain. Uh, this shows you just some different compounds here, benzoic acid analogs. These were all orally active, and this is for CNS, and it even has an acid. Yeah. So you'll hear a lot of bad things, and Mark and I always go back and forth. But he's starting to fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he actually has a compound that has an acid that's getting into the brain. Um, it depends on the whole molecule. So acids are saying, oh, no, they won't get into the brain. But the rest of the molecule is pretty lipophilic. And it's a balance, so it could it be a passive um, uh, transport into the brain? We don't know, but it's very hard even for a pharmacokinetic person to explain how we can manage to get these um, acid compounds into the brain, but we do. These compounds were very metabolically stable. They were very soluble, but they didn't have the selectivity we needed. Now here, when we started to play around out here with these cycloalkyl groups, um, we uh, got better selectivity and very potent compounds, but they weren't soluble, they were unstable, and they were inactive in the mice. <laughs> uh, this I want to show you because, you know, for all the years I've done science in this area, um, this was a metabolic hotspot for our, our compounds, and I would never have thought that the ring would just totally come off because we tried so many different permutations on this cycle alpha ring, which is a hotspot. Um, to make it more stable, but we, we couldn't do it. And so, I mean, this compound got chewed up by this coming off. This ring also got oxidated. Um, it got dioxidated, and then this methyl group also got oxidated. So there's just so many sites of a molecule that we have to worry about. You just have to get the right balance of the properties. This is just, I quickly want to show you that I showed you high throughput screens and how we identify hits and all that. Well, there's other ways to get um, chemical matter. For one of these programs, we had, these were um, reported, Gleevec and this inhibitor 2 was reported to lower A beta in the, um, in the body. And so what we did was we did a small screen of 50 compounds. And we came up with these two compounds that were 60 micromolar and 20 micromolar. But they each have structural alerts. This is an alpha beta unsaturated um, compound, which will nucleophilic attack here, and this cleaved. So the first thing to do was to try to make these stable, and the first thing we did was make these gamma amino alcohols by making this a, an OH instead of the ketone, so it couldn't cleave. And so that was a series, and then we, um, when you take out these methylene groups, you make aryl amides, and then following on this, this uh, pyridyl primidine meat. So we had actually three series that we started to get better potency than 26 micro and not from a high throughput screen. So mm -hmm. um, aryl amides, we, we cut down the methylene groups in the middle, we can make sulfonamides, it just gives you better rotation, better conformation, et cetera. And we actually were able to improve the um, potency. This is just a checklist when you have leads. You know, you want to get potency, SAR, cellular activity, selectivity, blah, 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 synthesis, I, intellectual property, I think I addressed in the synthesis. You want to have compound profiles, specific, of course, for your program, but you'll have all the data that you need and then all of the targeted values. And the, the, the values at the bottom here are usually very similar for any program. It's the biological profile that will change significantly. Screening trees, I told you we have different compound progression trees, we call them here, that you have your potency and then how you identify leads and how you identify in vivo candidates, but you have to have criteria for each of the assays that the compounds go through. I'm going to skip this. This I do want to point out because we ran into a little snag here with a program recently. Um, we got caught off guard with the luciferase assay because it's not a direct read of what you're actually testing. And um, so what we had to do was find an ELISA assay to actually compare to our in vitro assay because we had put compounds in animals following the data from a luciferase mm -hmm. assay and we didn't see efficacy. 
because we thought the potency was much more than it was in the last week. So what you identified with the Zipperbase inhibitor? <laughs> yeah, uh, probably, but they they were they, they showed some activity, but not as potent as that. At least I didn't. So it's, it's we do a lot of luciferase assays here, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a little concern. Um, we have additional tools we can use, modeling and structural biology. But at the end of the day, what we need is the right balance. We need the right balance, and it doesn't have to be the most potent compound, but but the potency, so activity, toxicity. We always have to worry about toxicity. Solubility, molecular weight, metabolic stability, and then if you're going into CNS types of uh, programs, brain penetration, and then we need bioavailability half life so that we have the balanced, optimized candidates to get in vivo efficacy to get up with the concept. So <laughs> I kind of rushed it at the end, but um, if you have questions, you know how to find me. Thank you. Any questions from this group? Yeah. Right. So, in your, in your view, what would be, out of all those uh, right balance criteria, what would be the, the most that you would rank at the top of it? Well, you first need something that shows biological activity and potency. Let yeah. me open the chat box and see if she has any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, why, why, or whatever the video that you decide to stop developing a heat? When what? You decide that a, a, a compound is not worth it to continue the program. Well, you, you, when you start a program, you have criteria. So you need compounds that are, even if it's early stage, greater than 50% of 10 micromolar, or, you know, you want less than one micromolar. And, and so, you know, after you make 10, 20 analogs of a certain area and 10, 20, and you're not getting anywhere with the criteria, then you stop. So, I mean, but you also have to put that into a perspective of time, too. Um, you know, I think after three months, if you, you're, you're getting somewhere, that's a good thing. Um, if you still have something that you really need to try to learn, because there's always going to be more compounds to make, and that's a real uh, hole to dig yourself into. You know. All right, we have no questions from our remote attendees. Everybody that's here, uh, if you haven't signed in yet, there is a sign-up sheet at the table. Please do so on your way out, because it helps us track. Oh, shoot, go ahead. Can we get a copy of your PDF? Yeah, I'll send it to uh, my guess. So yeah, I'll put it on the website. So yeah. was, uh, was your presentation recorded? Yeah, mm -hmm. it should be, have been uh, recorded and it we will have, be uploaded to the replay, right? There will be, a, yeah, it will be on a CCTS YouTube channel. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it was a yeah. really nice discussion today, guys. Thank yeah, you for being so interactive. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, everybody, from Sun Research. And uh, see you soon.